Let's check it out. See if this works. Go live. It's clicking in. All right. I think we're going here now, bro. Let's get this going again. Huh. All right. We're good. I think we're good. Check it out. All right, All man. Right. We in? See we are works. in. Go live. It's clicking in. All right. I think we're going here now, bro. Cool. Let's get this going. Yeah, we're good to go. We're in. All right, man. So that's good, actually, because it'll give us a good little fresh start. We were just warming up here, had some more technical technical difficulties, thought we had it all figured out. Welcome to Synth Fighter Podcast, Episode 1, Samurai versus Echo Craft. And uh, I just said this in the beginning, but I'll say it again. Absolute pleasure to have you here, man. This is the first one. We've been connecting back and forth. Yes, my friend, we've been connecting back and forth. Uh, I I've, I've followed your channel forever. And... <laughs> It's a pleasure having you. You're a legend, you're a musician, you're a producer, you make your songs, you've had a, an awesome past that we've talked about, you got an epic arsenal of synthesizers, and I mean, just thanks for coming on, man. What do you think? Oh, it's much appreciated. Trust me, man. Like, I, I've been following you since you started, um, and like I, I, I said, you... You did that one uh, one episode called The Shilling Thing, and I just died. I was like, this is hilarious. Um, you did something too that was really funny. Um, in the shilling or in the gas no, station? The gas station was great. Um, <laughs> the other thing that you did with I thought was great was um, the synth punk thing. Um, oh yeah, the synth punk kind of like saga, the drama of the synth yeah, punk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was pretty cool. Um, it's an interesting piece of, uh, I don't know, man, you, you tell me like the whole synthesizer community at the moment is kind of, when I, like when you watch it and I watch it, unless I find guys like you, the absolute legends in the bedroom musician world, kind of like what we do, where we live jam, we play. It, it, they're so hard to find, and when you come across them, it's to, to me, they're absolutely amazing musicians. The fact that people can get together, pull all this gear together by themselves, and just on the spot live jam is what is insane. Right. And it's kind of like the scene over here is just kind of gear tube. People make talking about gear, and it's. I just don't feel like they're that pumped up about it anymore. You tell you asked you you know you tell me what's going on. I'm just fired up. I'm a you're you're kind of a legend, old school in this whole thing. I'm kind of new in the whole synthesizer world, so I'm fired up all the time. I'm fired up when there's crap gear. I'm fired up when there's awesome gear. Just fired up, period, and just love talking about it. And I think you do too, because we shoot off about it all the time as well. You know? Yeah. Well, that's just it. Like I I I get pumped like to, because you know what it was. It, it's like I had growing up i had you know we had these big companies like you know arp and we had moog and we had uh we had roland yeah um you know yamaha you know all these synthesizers were like wicked expensive like i could never in a million years afford anything back then mm -hmm. um so i think now where everything's ready at our fingers and you know you and i both love behringer because of what or Beringa, big because time. of because of what you know, uh, Uli Berenger did, and 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 that was made classic synthesizers accessible. Yeah, man. You know, and people hate this. Uh, you know, it, and I got really mad. I don't know if you ever saw the video I did when people were hating on Berenger, and you had all of these these gear tubers, as you call them. That's perfect, by the way. Um, you know, you know, just ragging on Berenger. Oh, you know that that they're cloning everything. It's like, man, cloning has been going on. Give me a break. You know, the whole clone thing, man, knock that off, to be honest with you. And knock off the Behringer, like you just said, the Behringer. The fact that, that the, uh, I don't know, I call them the Synth Mafia. The fact that the Synth Mafia all got together and like in lockstep just said, we're not covering Behringer synths anymore. We're not going to like demo them. We're not going to rep them. And you know what? Fair enough. That's, that's their deal. But it kind of opened up this interesting space where cats like you, cats like me, the people who buy the gear are saying, well, if I want to watch a demo, I'm going to have to like look for a demo that's not like getting fed to me automatically in the feed. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that, and that's the thing that like, I just sat there and I, I said, you know what? I said, you know, it, it, here's the other thing. A lot of these people weren't around. I mean, I'm old, you know, yeah. so they weren't around back then. You know, a, a Moog, uh mini Moog was $4,500 when I was 16 years old. Yeah. I'm 62 now. And they're like, like okay, it's still the it, same price. <laughs> still the same price, which is also kind of weird and interesting because you think with inflation, Mini Moog should have been 
Should have been like 8,000. But I mean, come on. Like, I talk to Synth Punk every once in a while, and he loves the mini Moog, right? Absolutely yeah, great, adores great, it. And people adore it. It's a great synthesizer, it. yes. Did you ever play it? I have. So people kind of tell me, they're like, man, when you touch a Moog, it's like something different happens. When you touch that mini Moog, it's like this weird... And I've never played one, so I can't really talk on it. I just think it's crazy that it costs that much and it's a mono synth, but, you know? I, I mean, I think the whole thing behind it is a, it's a legend thing. So, I mean, you know, like when you play it, you're sitting there going, wow, this is the real deal. This is what everybody copied. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> everybody cloned. Um, and that's why I laugh when people give, you know, Behringer crap. Um, but, I mean... You know, I and when I went to Nam uh, a couple of years ago, and um, I went to the, the they had a small booth. Uh, the Moog Synth Museum had a small booth there, mm -hmm. and they had one of the original. Um, I think it was the, um, the big one, the 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 Moog One Hundred or whatever it was called. It was the big, like giant, the big wall. Yeah. Yeah. What was that? Uh, Someone in the chat knows that. I figure out what it was called, but it was all it was on. It was working. Um, and the guy that the original guy, the guy who bought that was the one of the very first ones. Yeah. Uh, he was there. So I talked to him. Um, so yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty interesting. Um, I played a mini Moog. Um, I knew somebody that had one. And it it and it is, it's it's I, I don't want to say it was like a religious experience. It was interesting, you know. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> I think some of the people who are saying it's a religious experience are doing a little something religious, if you know what I mean. Because <laughs> I, well, I just, I, you know what, you know what, dude, maybe they're right. Because you tell me if I'm wrong. I connect with all my sins as well, in, absolutely, in a yep. weird way. So I shouldn't hate on that because it's probably true. And I'll tell you something right now. If I drop six thousand dollars on a synthesizer, I feel like I would have to connect with that a little. Well, yeah, just uh, mentally to cope with the fact that. I, I could have bought a motorcycle, you know? Oh, exactly. I mean, you you know, I my my very first synthesizer, well, the very first synth I ever had uh, was a friend of mine. He let me borrow his Taurus pedals. Yeah. Um, and I played those with my hands. I had my, oops, I had my fists. <laughs> and because I had it up on a table. Um, and then when I, I actually had some money, uh, I must have been about 20 years old and I ended up buying a... Um, what was it? It was, oh, Juno 106. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of people say that's a religious experience, you know, um, because it was one of the first analog synths. You had the Juno 60, you know, uh, analog synths. I shouldn't say that. Analog synths that was priced moderately. Yeah. Um, because uh, I paid $900 for it brand new. Um, you know, well, now you can't touch the thing for, for less than two grand. Yeah, that's true. Um, but I mean, you know, that was a big deal for me. That was a lot of money back in the eighties. I was like, wow, like I'm dropping 900 bucks on this keyboard. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, but I mean, you know, with anything like when I got the matrix brute, that to me was a religious experience <laughs> because oh, the mate, the dude, matrix, listen, the, the matrix look at the matrix brute is a religious experience. Just looking at it on a screen. I can't imagine what it's like having it there. Well, I mean, when you look at it, it kind of looks like a mini Moog. Yeah, yeah. You know? It's got the flip top. Yeah. It's bigger though, right? Um, Way bigger. No, it's, yeah, it's much bigger. Um, but I mean, the things that you can do with that, it's crazy. You know, uh, I mean, it's got three oscillators, it's got it's got a, it's got two sub oscillators. Paraphonic? Uh, it's duophonic. Duophonic, okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, and the matrix on it, the, the, why it's called the matrix brute is basically the matrix uh that you use. And I don't know if you've ever seen what people do with it. They make these funky looking designs and stuff because That's they cool, light up man. different colors, but they actually do something. It actually means something. So it's different ways of patching things. And setting um, up, yeah, and setting up sequences and everything, right? Yeah. It just can run crazy sequences. It's got a really nice feature too, where you can uh, use the arpeggiator and the sequencer mm -hmm. um, and have it link up to uh, a MIDI clock, yeah. uh, which you could do some really interesting things with. Um, but I mean, you know, I've I've dropped some serious money. I mean, right in front of me, you can't see that either. But I have a Dave Smith instrument, um, a sequential Rev Two. Sixteen, uh, sixteen or it's, eight? It's I. Well, I got the eight at first, and then I ended up buying the board and I put it in myself. So it's at sixteen now. Bro, that's um, I played that 
from my buddy's one once when we went I went back home and he had it and I only got to touch it for a minute. Dude, that thing is mental too. It's the the what I wish every key bed felt like this. The key bed on this thing just feels so good. Um and the things that you can do with this synthesizer. Now you've got other people saying, "Oh, the Rev2 isn't as good as the you know, the the sequential circuit 6 or whatever whatever it's I, I'm yeah. like come on man like people should stop comparing things because it's a different bird it's a different breed it's a different synthesizer yeah just like you know just like the the uh so the, OP, the op6 is different than the the wave state i mean it, it's yeah. they're different beasts the only you know thing I mean? the only thing that is worthy of comparison is analog versus v or i shouldn't say analog hardware versus vst and i know on your channel too man you got uh you've been doing a lot of stuff with vsts especially with the cherry audio some real cool stuff with cherry audio vsts and you also got a ton of hardware i'm kind of super adverse to vsts and i think it's because you see how my let me just switch this view up for a sec actually you can probably see it on your end but you see how my screen is up there yeah so if i'm using a vst I'm kind of like this, right? Yeah. And it, it, like, it's just, I think it's because ergonomically, I don't feel good. I'm like, screw VSTs, not into them, not into them at all. But the couple that I tried, I, to be to be honest, if you took it and did what uh, Von Gon did and just put a VST in a box, can you really tell the difference? Because like when you play a VST, if you try one of the crazy ones that are like a clone of a, a actual classic piece of hardware, what do you think? Well, I mean, like sound, you know, you, sound wise. Yeah, sound wise. I mean, some of the stuff you can't really tell the difference. I can't. I, maybe it's my old ears. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you got I those vampire ears, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> I played in metal bands all my life, and and like, yeah, I, I'm. I actually I punctured my right eardrum at one point. Um, so I am like ten percent deaf in my right ear, which sucks. But, um, but you know. I really like certain things that like this is the this is the um OBXA uh synth module plugin that's out there yeah. and um I downloaded it and I and I like it it's fun you know what I mean um CR CR what about the CR um what was that CR76 the CR78 drum or 78 machine. dude that thing is sick man I I know what the original sounds like um I went to a synth museum uh back in 98 yeah um and this guy was i don't know if I, if anybody saw the the last uh the thing i did with the cat with the behringer cat i talked about this a little bit but legend this guy, synth man this guy yeah the cat's off that thing is ridiculous that's a whole other story but yeah uh, we'll get into that in a minute but um i literally went to this museum we had to make an appointment uh it was by appointment it was in this guy's house and we had to buy him a happy meal in order for us to get in it's just <laughs> this is so bizarre was he a vampire so my, no so yeah. my buddy and i uh we went there and and so we we bring this guy to mcdonald's and he's just he's just kind of like short little dude and yeah and he's like yeah he's like um you know you buy me a happy meal and and that's your that's your um your entry fee nuggets so i don't know i forget what he ate dude so <laughs> so my buddy sean and i looked at each other and we're like okay so uh, we went in and it was, it was sad in a way because I saw things that I dreamt about that I only read about in like keyboard magazine and, um, oh. and they were all coveted cat hair and oh. there was cats everywhere. Oh. Oh. And oh. Oh. there was, dude, dude, there was, there was, um, uh, cause he was constantly blowing his nose. Cause I don't know if he was allergic to cats or what, <laughs> um, but Every single room in the house, there was an original Behringer. Uh, Behringer. There was an original Wasp. There was an original what? Op, yeah, Op twenty six hundred. There was um, an original. There were two original Moog uh, minis. Um, he he was a DX seven collector. He had like six DX sevens, and he programmed for DX seven. Wow. Um, there were. Uh, it, it, I can't even. How many cents? How many cents ballpark did he have stacked up in there? I, I probably some there was stuff leaning against walls on top. Oh of my things. god, synth hoarder! Yeah, I, oh. I I have to say there was probably 
oh man, at, at least 100 and 150 synthesizers. My friend Sean and I just looked at each other like, what the F is going on, man? Like, we, um, unfortunately, the guy died um, a couple of years ago. And so I looked it up to see, like, what do they do with the synths? Like, yeah. you know, um, and he had no will and testament. So what happened was, I think there's another synth museum down in Florida. Um, they ended up taking all that stuff. I think where is like it? Where is it in Florida? I'm not sure. You know what? If we go online, um, you could look up synth museum, and I believe it was in New Hampshire. That's where we went, uh, New Hampshire. Um, and I forget the guy's name, but yeah, he he ended up passing away. He died of complications and stuff. Um, but it was a it was a really interesting situation, and it was it was funny because. Let me tell you, I went home and took a major shower that day. Yeah. <laughs> um, just what? Because because just it felt so so like dirty it was just, or whatever. It, it was skeevy, dude. Like like I said, my buddy and I were both like looking at each other, going, "Wow, this is kind of creepy." But you know, and he was super nice. Don't get me wrong; he was a really nice guy. Definitely a recluse, I guess, is what you'd yeah. call him. Um, but. You know, very and super smart man. Like he started talking about uh waveforms and stuff of stuff I never even heard of. And I'm like, I was like going, wow, like I didn't even know that waveform yeah. existed. At that you point, know? it's like, what? Because there's a whole new language, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and but anyway, that's that's when I discovered the wasp. And I was I I had a little dat recorder with me. Yeah. And I sampled the crap out of everything in there. But the wasp I stuck with for probably like an hour. We were in there for like five hours. Um, Man, that sounds awesome. And I, I just, I sampled the hell out of the wasp. And then I just, I, and the, uh, the ARP 2600. Uh, it was a gray one. It was the, uh, the gray, the gray meanie, I guess they call it. Or, yeah. Um, and uh, I sampled the hell out of those. And I don't know what I did with the samples. They're gone somewhere, but. Uh, but then when Behringer came out with the wasp, I was like, oh my God, I have to have this. The wasp is, if you ask me, and I don't know much about anything, but when I played the wasp, it got a real unique, different kind of sound than any of the other stuff I got, man. Absolutely. You, bro, are you seeing this countdown clock going on? Is No. Zoom's counting me down saying I got seven minutes left. Upgrade now. What's the deal with that? That's remember last night when we were doing this? It That's us? right. Yeah, yeah. So if it boots us, we'll just reboot, all right? I don't get it. Why does it do that? It's my first time ever using Zoom. I have no idea. Do you got I, Zoom? He's got a, yeah, I have Zoom. I just don't know. I, I've i used it for, literally for work. Yeah, <laughs> and you don't ever get the boot? <laughs> well, I don't know, because I when I joined, when I used to join in, uh, when I worked from home during COVID, I, I had to, I joined into something. So however my manager set it up, there's got to be a way to uh, set up the time. Well, either way, se um, seven minute countdown clock is going on my end. If we get cut, we'll just reboot. All right. That's cool. All right. See what happens. But either way, yeah. So, man, tell me a little bit more about that Behringer cat because I was checking the Behringer cat out as well. And when you did that little video, it's got such a cool looking interface. Yeah. The sliders are cool. And the sound you got out of that when you put it through uh, some effects was crazy. It's. I, so I remember the cat when it came out and, and um, I was like, oh, you know, here's a, back then too. It was like when synths came out and they kind of looked similar to other synths, um, kind of like the ARP Odyssey and like uh, kind of like a Moog. Yeah. Um, you know, I was kind of like going, eh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't really own any synths back then either. And I wanted to, but um when I got this, I was blown away at the fact that um, you can manipulate the waveforms. Um, so there's not, you're not just stuck to just say like, a sawtooth or a, a square wave, or uh -huh. you literally can change that waveform. So you get a square wave that's all the way positions all the way down at the bottom. That's the square. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you stop messing with it. And um, I haven't put it on an oscilloscope yet, but I'm going to, I want to, I want to see what those waveforms look like. Cause they, you get some really interesting sounds out of that. Um, and I like the fact that it is, uh, you, you can hook up more than one together and get uh 16 note polyphony out of it. So, <sighs> which is kind of cool. Dude. And um, how cool is it that Behringer just did like, I was knocked it out of the park with these modules, man. Like it's crazy. 
It's so genius what they went and done. And I went and you might have saw this article at Behringer posted it and they were talking about how they copied the uh, the car manufacturing process. And you know yeah. how like there came a certain point in time where it was like if you bought a Dodge, Ford, you're like, why are the cars always look the same now? Yep. It's because they all adopted this weird molding and casting yep. scenario where they could just go. <laughs> so Behringer, the genius with the modules and their 16 or their keyboards like the Deep Mon style now and the UBXA and the minis and yep. the Crave Edge thing, man, they just got it. It's almost like they're getting to a, a level where they'll be able to put anything in all these, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, the, I, and, and they're their own synths, right? They are. Yeah, They're, well, I mean, people people said that the DeepMind 12 was a copy of a Juno 106. I own two Juno 106s. It's nothing like a Juno 106. I yeah. think the, the DeepMind 12 is probably the most original thing that they've done. Yeah. Um, and and the other, um, what is it? The one, that, the, the one the that's Neutron? above you there. The Neutron. The Neutron is nuts. Yeah, that's very original. Um, but I mean, the DeepMind 12... The engine that's in it's got TC electronics uh, uh, effects Effect. built into it. The effects Sounds are crazy for their first know? synth too. Yeah, do you know and like they don't get enough credit if you ask me? And almost like, what do you think? It's kind of, do you think it's kind of weird that they were like, why did they even attach it to the Juno? You know, like well, that's I couldn't figure that out. I get it because I understand the idea of like piggybacking off of people's nostalgia. I get it. It's genius marketing, but like well, I think, that was so I, good, it almost could have been its own. Well, I think why why they they made it like on Sonic State too. Like I, I you know I watch Sonic State all the time, and yeah, you know me too. When it came out, they were like they were like, oh, it's it's a it's basically the their Juno clone, and I'm like, why? Because it has sliders on it, and not knobs. It doesn't look like one. It doesn't look like it. It doesn't sound like it. It's completely, the engine is right. completely different. So who labeled it a Juno clone? That started out, I, I, the first time I heard that was on Sonic State. So do you think that that kind of, that Sonic State was like, this is like a Juno-esque style thing, and then Behringer was like, light bulb, what if we clone all the synths now? Because people, like, do you think that, they, do, Maybe. You think, do you think the chicken came before the egg there where they were That's, like, oh, interesting. That's, that's interesting, dude. Like, I... I seriously, I never thought of it because like that. what if? Because guess what, Deep Mind, because you what Behringer would have done, they would have called it a, a Jono, or you know, they would have because right. that's what they started doing after they called it a Deep Mind, which was their own synth. And what was their right. second synth? Was their second synth the Neutron? Uh or what? Anyone know the second synth in the chat? What was the second? Yeah, synth? I don't even. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Or was it the MS One? Oh Any... no, it was the it was the Model D. Okay, so the Model D was the second one. I believe so, yeah. Which, that's another great synthesizer. Like, <laughs> yeah. you have one of those, too. Dude, the Model D is nuts. It's so cool, man. It's such, and it's like such small form factor. And what we said before, the Model D, if you buy a Mini Moog for five grand, you can buy a Model D for 250. Look how yeah. many Model Ds you could, imagine just stacking up that money's worth of Model Ds. Well, I forget the guy that was on, he was on uh, YouTube and he, he did this, he did a, a comparison. Starsky? But, he did a, but it, no, it wasn't Starsky. It was a blindfold test. Mm -hmm. And dude, you couldn't tell the difference. So that's what, you know, a lot of people say, oh, be, well, Behringer's using cheaper parts than, than Moog and, you know, Moog's all hand wired. And I'm like, baloney. Uh, but I'm sitting there going, but what do you think? These are made, I get it, they're made in China, but they're also hand-wired. Robots aren't wiring these. Give me a break, dude. <laughs> Mo Grand, the biggest, biggest psyop on everybody for so many years. The Made in America thing. Like, I didn't know until I looked into it, and I was like, and then and then when everybody was like, oh, Behringer's made in China. I'm like, dude, it's all made over there. What are you kidding me? Everything's made in China, man. Everything anyway is made over there for everything. So these days it's hard to be like anything's made in America. It's all basically assembled here. And if it's made here, I mean, what you, you're you're going to some guy's shed and getting a sword blacksmith in his shed. You know, right. like that's made in America. Or if well, someone cuts is, down a tree. Well, the other thing too is like, you know, um, you have – you had companies like Roland and All right, hold Clark. on, hold on, player. We're gonna get the boot. We're gonna re oh. reboot this back up. All right. All right, hold on. 
All right, we're going to reboot this because for some weird reason, this is kicking us out. So let's get it going here. Just bear with me now. We'll get the chat. You guys just do your thing there for a minute. We'll get old Echo back on board here. Start meeting. Join audio. How's everything going? People in the chat, what do you think, man? I think it's going pretty good. I'm, I'm down, man. Echo is a great guy. What a legend, man. If you guys don't ha haven't subscribed on his channel, then uh, go over and check it out. He's an absolute top tier legend, man. And I can't say enough good things about him. And like I said, we had some technical difficulties last night, but we ended up sorting it all out. And it seems tonight, does anybody know why I'm getting kicked out of Zoom? Does that make any sense? This is live TV, so that's how it goes. We yeah, had great stream so far. It's good, man. Synth Fighter's cool. Great session. Love this. Yeah. Just subbed Echo. Echo's got cool videos, man. I'm going to get him back in here now as soon as he comes in. There we go. Guess we just got to reboot. We got to pay the money. I'll have to talk to the accountant about upgrading this here. All right, baby. You back? Yeah. Is what's it a bro thing? Is that what they're asking for? They're asking for money, man. Kimmy. All right. We're back, baby. All right. So we got, I don't know. They'll give us another countdown a bit. We got a half hour, which should make it good. All right. So, so yeah, back to what we're saying here. The whole um, made overseas is it made in America, and I love America, as you can see, but it's baloney. Well, like I started to say, like you have companies like Roland and Korg who actually started making stuff back in uh, in Japan again, mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of cool. Um, Very cool. But, you know, because they're doing that, what are they doing? They're jacking up the price. Yeah. Uh, which I thought was kind of crazy, but, you Don't, know, it is, this is the world we live in, man, so... <laughs> The crazy thing about the crazy thing about Japan too, like I lived, I went didn't live in Japan, but I've been to Japan numerous times. And man, when you go over there and stay in a hotel, unless you're in Tokyo, which is super high tech or one of the big cities, when you go in a hotel sometimes and stay, dude, the they'll have a TV in there from the '80s. Because remember, they were the king of hardware yep. when they put out a TV. Sony back in the day, Toshiba, yep. the, Fuji, all this stuff was insane hardware, and they just. Um, they didn't adapt, and then South Korea came along, and China came along, and once software started getting huge, they missed the boat. Right. They missed the boat, and then they got stuck in the hardware, and it took them forever to even catch back up. And I don't personally so don't know have if they got back CR up. So was that like a giant? You, you were in the hotel, and it was like a giant CRT CRT tube in there, or was it? Like <laughs> oh, dude, a no giant, no fuck no. Went in there, check into the hotel. You go to the bathroom. There's like. The tiniest toilet and there's no shower there's like a little kind of square bucket you open up and you get in there and grab it hose off in the shower and you come out and lie in the room and the tv was only about that big and it only had like six channels i was like i was like what i had sumo wrestling i had some music thing i had some weird japanese news and then i was just like i gotta get out of here so i just darted out in the street and cruised around went to some nice. food stalls and stuff but they got left I in got, the dust. They got left in I, the dust. I got a buddy of mine that's over there right now. He couldn't wait to go. He's wicked into anime and all that stuff. So he was just like, dude, I got to go. I'm going. I'm like, all right, cool. He went by himself. Um, I guess he's meeting another friend of mine over there who lives in Australia. So mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of cool. But um, he's already sent some pictures and stuff. Japan's pretty dope, man. It's uh, Dude, Asia's dope. It's, right? it's, it's amazing. <laughs> and And it's like... Before I went over, I had a, I had this image in my head. And don't get me wrong, I'm from Newfoundland, Canada, tiny little island. Nobody barely leaves it ever. And when I went over, I had this image in my head. And when I landed in South Korea, I was like, holy mother of God, this actually just made my head explode. It was like, because that was like, when did I go over? 2000 and, 2003 or something I went over? Yeah. And the internet wasn't really booming like crazy. So you couldn't get tons of content about over where I was going. And dude, when I got there, it blew my mind. Then when I went to China, it blew my mind and all over the place there. And that's why everyone talks about Chinese stuff being crap, man. That's a load of bull too. Yeah, they make crap because we want cheap stuff here. But you go to China, man, they're using the primo of primo stuff. Really? Oh, and the technology is through the roof. Just, oh, it's, yeah. You know, like, so like yeah, when people are like, that's made in China, I'm like, man, yeah, it's made in China and it's probably better than half the crap you're getting here. Well, yeah, nothing's made here. So I mean, and I love America though. So don't get me wrong. <laughs> oh, I, I, I do too. 
I do too. I'm American through and through, man. Uh, I, I USA, baby. That's right. But I just, you know, I literally just sit there and I go, well, look, you know, I don't like the fact that everything's made in China, but Me I mean, neither. it is what it is. And what are you going to do about it? Well, you, know you got to I mean? do something. You got to, something's got to happen. You know, at some point they're going to have to start making stuff here. Right. At some point. And you hope that there's going to be some type of parity achieved globally where we get some parity in cost and yeah. then stuff will be able to be, then you're not going to send stuff to China and Vietnam or Indonesia to get made or Mexico. You're going to be like, well, we're on parity now, whether that's some type of new financial system that's being set up behind the scenes between like the BRICS and the US. There's stuff going on behind the scenes that we're getting ready to switch this financial system over like we're going to wake up and it's going to be switched and we won't even because everything's digital now anyways they pretend right. it's not but it is it's already digital all the money's oh, yeah. digital there's no money in the banks it's like come on I, that's why like my wife gets mad at me all the time because i never have any cash on me i, I, I use plastic for everything yeah I, everybody does i, I think it's 96 percent of all transactions now are done digitally iphone it's like ever since apple came out with apple pay i'm just like boom if it's accept if it's accepted there i'm just like boom done you know yeah, what i mean yeah um but no i i hear you man like you know the other thing that what always struck me that that's kind of strange about manufacturing here in the states is like people like well you know people that work in the united states want more money and that's why everything's so expensive and i'm like mm. no man it's because they just keep printing money yeah. that's why it's so expensive <laughs> Like everyone's like, it's so expensive. It's like, no, it's not expensive. It's just your money's worth less. That's it's right. this weird mind game they got everyone running on. Think every the pr the prices are gone. No, the prices aren't gone nowhere. Your money's right. not worth anything anymore. Yep. But anyways, back to the synth. So we were talking about the VST versus hardware thing, and I know oh, yeah. you, I know you got uh, the Wave State. I know you got the Op Six. I know you got the Mod Wave, the Osmos Expressive E. What's your kind of experience enjoying those digital ones versus, say, some of the Behringer analogs, right? Because what's your top analog you got that you like the most, top analog synth in there? Um, that you're like, this is the go-to go -to in here? Well, it's it's three of them, actually. But, um, Let's hear it, then. The one that's at my fingertips right now, I'm going to have to say, would be the uh, sequential. Ooh. Um, because that's what I, I, I mean, that's my main keyboard mm -hmm. that I actually use to uh, use MIDI to trigger um, my software stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's just the keyboard just feels good, man. Um, Hayes, and I will say, Hayes Anderson says VSTs are fiat synths. But anyway, go on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, fiat makes a great little car, dude. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember the... Oh, you remember the Fiero that you could buy a Lamborghini kit for back in the day? Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, go on. Yeah. So you got um, you got the, the sequential rev too. Yeah, and I mean, I you know, it would be it would be tossed between those uh, as far as analog goes, is the deep mind, the the matrix brute and the sequential. Oh yeah, the matrix um, brute. Come on, man. It's gotta be the matrix but, brute. But then when you have like, you know, the osmos is just a completely different breed. It's a it's a rare bird in itself. Some people hate it. Some people love it. What do you love about it? Tell tell, tell me what you kind of like about that. Because I've been looking I, at that. I like the fact that because I do play guitar, I like the fact when I go to bend a note on a guitar, I, I feel it. I bend the note. Yeah. You know, um, I've always wanted to do that on a keyboard. Like, so when you're playing a keyboard, I'm going to have my hands up here for a second. And, you know, you, you, I'll just use my phone. So you're playing a keyboard and all of a sudden, you know, if you get that feeling like when you're playing the keyboard, you know, where am I? Here it is. Yeah, yeah. You kind know, of you kind of want to wiggle your finger like try big, to get like sustain out of it. Big time. And nothing happens. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you had an aftertouch keyboard. Yeah. And, and you go to a non aftertouch. When I when I started using aftertouch, I was like, okay, this is this is crazy. Exactly. That thing takes it to a whole different level. So what does so it got? I, X X and Y and pressure. What? what X, Y, pressure. Um, what else? Uh, being able to bend. Like, so if I, if I hold down a chord yeah, and I can, I can bend notes up on my, what my right hand, I don't want to do that forever. Nuts. Yeah. You know, usually what I would do is I would, I would play the keyboard bass part with a bass chord 
Uh, and then I would overdub it and I'd use the pitch bend or the, the, the mod wheel to yeah. get uh, some expression out yeah. of it. Um, and now I just play it on the keyboard. So here's, here's the thing. Getting back to software sense. MPE is the, that's the future. Seems that's like that's where, where it's going, man. That's where we're going. So that might trade places. So the, the, the Osmos might come over where the, uh, the sequential is only because I'm finding out a lot of MPC, uh, MPE synths. Yeah. Um, I've been starting to experiment with them a little bit. Uh, Autoria pigments yeah. uh, is one. Um, and any of the cherry audio stuff, believe it or not. Oh, so you um, can, you, you'll be able to use that Osmos to control the VSTs with the MPE. Yes. Wow. Um, and like I said, I've already tried it with, uh, with the, with pigments. Um, and I did mess around with the cherry audio, um, uh, cat that I did the demo on, uh, and that has an MPE section. What about the, just, what about the Rev2? Can you Osmos into the Rev2 or Re you know what I mean? Use that to control any MP in the Rev2, or is it can't do it on that? Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I I I don't I don't think the Rev2. Well, probably doesn't have it, does it? Because that's came it does, out. Or it does, does it? have like some aftertouch to it, um, but it's not like like it's a classic aftertouch where like you know you can. You can't, it's not so just much cut off. Yeah. Up. Yeah. You cut off, you can open the cut off. Yeah. And add some LFO. Down. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's cool, but being able to control, um, control pitch bend control, like, dude, there's one thing that I did today. Um, I, I was putting a little piece together with, uh, the wasp and the, and the cat. Yeah. And I said, Hey, you know what? I'm going to try throwing some osmos on there. And one thing that blows my mind about this synthesizer is mm -hmm. touch. You barely touch it. So I was oh, doing like so kind of like, so you become a, you become one with it a little bit because you really got to be mindful of what you're doing. Exactly, it's touch sensitive on certain patches. So I literally was just touching the synth because I was doing the kind of like this ambient thing. Yeah, and and I was getting this expression out of it, and and then. Every once in a while, I'd press a little bit hotter and it would, it would open up the filter a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh. Dude, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. So so what's that going for? What's that, 1500 bucks for that? What's that go for? 1700 actually. It's not even like 1799 It was 1700 What do you think, worth it? Oh, man. I, and so my guy at Sweetwater, I I had him throw in a Moog uh, expression pedal. Yeah. Um, Because I was like, because here's the other dope thing about this. So you plug in two expression pedals. There's two ports. So one controls uh, one controls Ooh. the filter opening and closing. You become the octopus. Yeah, man. It's like, and I'm a drummer by oh, trade. Cool, so like, man. So I was I got I got two pedals hooked up to it right now. And so you can control the pitch bend with that, also sustain, and also with the other pedal, you can open up and close the filters. All right, so how many parameters? You got two expression pedals. How many parameters with two hands can you run? You can, can you, so can you have a different parameter on the top of the keyboard and the bottom? So, for yes. example, so you can wiggle the bottom. Yes. And then wiggle the top and you get two different expressions going. Yes. Plus the pedals. Plus the pedals. Jeez. It's nuts. Come on. So, when I bought this thing too, my wife was like, another synth, right? Yeah. Oh, well, guess what? That's what's <laughs> up. <laughs> so I so I said, yeah. So when I showed it to her, even she thought it was interesting. Um, and my wife, she knows nothing about instruments. Mm -hmm. um, she's a chef. Um, but she understands the whole thing between, like, tools. And she's probably a very intelligent woman that understands when you hear something special yeah. It's universal. She's like, could be like, whoa, okay. Now I kind of understand why you got well, that. Well, you know, it's funny because like a lot of, a lot of people, not just, you know, my wife, but a lot of people will say, well, dude, doesn't that synthesizer sound like the other one? It goes right. And I'm yeah. like, yes and no, they're all different. They all have different voices. They're like people. They have different voices. They do. And that's, dude, that's another crazy thing to jump back to Behringer for a second. Whenever, like, you got such cool videos because you just demoed the wasp and the cat. 
-hmm. the wasp and the cat don't sound the same. Nope. They just don't. Not at all. They don't, right? And my Model D and my Neutron don't sound the same. And I hear nope. this all the time. People are like, oh, the Behringer synths all sound the same. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, dude, what? you have the Poly. The Model Poly? That thing is unbelievable. Dude, the Model Poly is just absolute next level awesome. Yep. This thing right here, the look of it, the feel of it, it's heavy duty. So like... The fact that people like it's a cheap synth. I think I picked that up for I think I got that 499 bucks on sale at Sweetwater. They had a flash sale. Yeah. And I should have bought six of them. But and just <laughs> you know, sold them, <laughs> got some more. And I really should have bought six of them. But I have gas for that synth. I've had it for a while. I'm telling you right now, if you got gas for this synth, go pick it up. Because we're wait for a deal, but man, it's just very cool sounding and you can do such cool things with it. Yeah. And like I got it running through three effects pedals at the moment. I got it running in like series. So I got it running through a chorus. I got run it then into a delay, then into nice. a reverb, right? And I just kind of play around sometimes with the settings. But for most of the part, I kind of you know how you got pedals and stuff, and you kind of yeah. you get you kind of leave it. And same with the mono poly. Sometimes I a lot of times I just have that left on a patch that I really like, and then I'll deviate from the patch a little bit. You know the deal. Yep. Right. So. Cheap synths aren't cheap, baby. No, nope. you know that's a little bullet. Bullets. And Baron Behringer proved that. You know they proved it. They exposed I, it. Pulled up the curtain. The uh, the deep mind that I have, uh, there is one problem with it, and they use a really inexpensive backlighting. It gives you that old. It's a very old school look. Yeah. Um, and they did it on purpose because it it's supposed to be like a vintage kind of synth. You talking about on the screen? The screen itself, okay, the yeah. backlighting, yeah. the backlighting started to die on it. Hmm. Um, so I turned it way down. And what I use is um, I use the Behringer DeepMind 12 software to yep. go through my patches now. So I don't even look at the screen. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah, it links directly to it. So, but that's the only thing that you know. And then you and I both had the issue with the Wasp knob. Yeah, um, the Wasp and, knob, man. And you and you showed me those chicken heads, so. I can't even. Perfect. So should we tell people? Like, yeah, what tell them what did? you did. Yeah. So I, <laughs> like for, I'll just go first. I had the wasp, as you know, we did the raffle on, which also before we get into that. Uh oh, Rich just asked. We're giving this away. We got. All right. So this is getting raffled off soon. This modded up RD6. That is modded, isn't it? It's modded. Though. What? So what? So how did the. So this is done by. Hold on. What's the name of the guy? Uh. Mafez is his name from uh, Hive Mind Synthesis. Does the mods for people, oh, right? Hive Mind. Okay, okay, yeah, they're great. So you see the kick drum? Can you see this? I can't. No. Okay. Anyways, oh, I probably have to go over to this one for you. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. So you see the kick drum, right? Oh, look at that. Okay. So you got the you got all the mods on there for the kick, the snare, and dude, when I when I demoed it, it. Uh, I, you, I watched when, the video. Yeah, when you turn those, but it, it's hard to see it. But when you turn those things on, it makes a crazy difference. So that RD6 modded is fucking. It's just, it, it, when you flick the switches, it just bangs way louder. And you see, get the, you got some tune you can put on the snare or uh, the, all, the, the different settings and stuff too, right? But anyway, so you're gonna so you're gonna give it away. You're not gonna keep it. No, nah, I'm gonna give it away, man. Me and uh, actually Rose is in the chat. Rose Samurai wrote me and he said. You want to? You want this synth? Demo it, and I was like, "Yeah." And we talked about. it. I was like, "I'll demo it, man, and raffle it off." Because, man, I got enough stuff I'm trying to learn here, you know. So, to get a synth that you're not expecting thrown in the mix, man, it can throw your whole world off. No, you, I, you, I was, dude. I was, I was playing with the the uh, mini lug today, um, and I, I was like, I forgot like how to do something on it, and I went, "Okay, okay, okay. Let me think. Let me think." And then all of a sudden, it came to me because. We have so many toys, and you—they're all different. Yep. They all act different, like the the TD3. And they're deep. Oh yeah, yeah. The, like the TD3 MO, that's an exact replica the way it's designed. Yeah. Of the TD3. Yeah. Um, I also have a Roland T TB03 and a TB3. Yeah. I love drum machines and TB303s. I, it's just me. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've also got a bunch of stuff in my closet too that. One of these days, I'm going to pull out. Um, I have an SEO two in there. Mm -hmm. um, 
that is a great synth, another kind of uh, Moog clone, yeah. if you will. Um, but again, a lot of them, like I don't use them. I've got the the monologue. Um, the monologue, yeah. I got the red monologue, which I think you see that spot that's empty right there. You got to fill that, man. Well, that's gonna be that's where the monologue's gonna go. Oh, you got to put that <laughs> up there, man. And it's red. You got the red. It's one? red. Yeah. Okay, red that's one. cool. Right next to the MS one. Let yeah, me ask so you another. Let me ask you another question. How important is aesthetics of a synth when you buy it? Do you not care about what it looks like? And you're just like, oh, that sounds amazing. Let's 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 do that. Or are you also like, you have to have some type of attraction to it. You know, it's like, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna go out on a date with someone you're not attracted to. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know and I, mean? I think aesthetics has a lot to do with it because when I look at something and I like, what's that thing that you? Which one? You showed. It's like uh, the pedal. Was it? No, no, the, the that synth that they just came out with. Uh, oh, the uh, the swarm, the swarm. Oh, the Von Gon, the Von Gon. Yeah, the Von Gon replay, which yeah, is I like, this. listen, if you're gonna call it a name, don't steal the name of Korg's most disastrous release of 2023. Right? You remember that? Yes, the Korg replay. I haven't even seen anyone do a proper demo of that yet. That was such a disaster. So, but anyway, I, look at, I looked at that and I went, eh. And then, like, I, I build custom uh, PC keyboards, even though I'm a Mac guy. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I pull, you know, I do the whole switches and all that stuff and keycaps. And when I saw that, I went, so is this for like the, is this for like the the, the keyboard enthusiast who likes to build synth, uh, build uh, PCs? Like, I go, I don't, I don't understand the purpose of the synthesizer. <sighs> and not for nothing. Confusing. It and the, sounded, it sounded crappy to me. Like putting it through the pedals obviously when that uh girl what's her name sarah bella reed she did the one yes. where she had it running through the ultra shear and the what's the other one called the polygon or poly something right. i can't remember anyways yeah. she had it running through both of them and i mean i could run i could run dishwater through that and it would sound amazing because when you stuff you know the deal dude when you put stuff through pedals it goes nuclear yeah like when you put the behringer cat through or not pedals or you know vsts whatever you're putting it through plugins it yeah. goes nuclear. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, and that's the other thing I wanted to mention this too earlier was polyphrase. That's what it is. The um Thanks, Hayes. Oh, yeah. That's a really nice pedal. Um, and they look good too, man. But that's so the that's thing. Just... Those pedals look so good. And well, boutique, boutique I don't pedals get, look amazing anyway. I don't get the synth. No, I don't either. I don't get it. I don't. Do you get it? No, you don't. Is it a joke? Me of... Was it a joke? I don't think so, because a lot of the heavy hitters will like going, oh, this is great. This is cool. And I'm like, and then, you know, she's like, oh, you can take the switches out and make them less clicky. I'm like, dude, and they were clickety. Even when she changed them to they, acquire. I went back and watched it. I was like, these things are so clicky. I think this is a joke. But then I was no. like, this isn't a joke. And guess what? I'm not hating on Von Gon or I can't remember the dude's name who runs the company because it's a small company. And I think what they're doing is awesome. And I love their pedals. But that there was just confusing to me because yeah. I don't know if they ran out of money. I don't know if this is what I think. This is my opinion. They got to a point with the synthesizer where the break even slash make money slash lose money was 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 putting a rush on. And they were right. like, all right, what are we going to do? We got everything's under the hood. We got the chassis. What are we going to do? What's the cheapest right. paint? Spray painted beige. And, you know, it just didn't make any sense. It was very... Um, they should have made it the same look as the Von Gon pedal. It should have been like black with wood trimmed around the whole thing. Right. With red knobs and uh, uh, white... Do you know how awesome that would have looked? Then you could actually got the Von Gon pedals and that and been like, nice. Well, the aesthetic of the whole thing was just kind of... I looked at it and I go... This oh, is man. like, and like, and you mentioned this, like, you know, what, what it does a synthesizer attract you? And yes, it does. You know, not 100%. everything, not everything's going to look great, but I mean, you know, like I'm looking at, I have, I, people gave me a hard time about this. I bought the donor, uh, B1. Yep. Um, that don't look good, bro. It, I got to tell you though, this thing cranks, <laughs> cranks with that thing is, well, that's the whole reason I kind of didn't give it a second glance. I was like, that don't look well, I, good, but well, the other, 
The other banks. thing too is because it was on sale at Christmas time for seventy nine dollars, and I bought it. Okay, all right. You it know? could look, it could look like anything for that. Yeah, yeah. So, but I got to tell you, the distortion on this thing. And that's what a base a base synth. It's what? a base synth. It's a it's a TB three hundred three. Okay. Um, that's why I said I love TB three hundred threes, because when I when I was looking at TB three hundred threes, they were thousands of dollars. So were you and, a techno? Were you a techno guy kind of coming up? Was that your lane? Or you just liked uh, the sound of that? I did a lot of, back in the uh, early 90s, I did a lot of trance and techno stuff. Okay, cool. Um, that's what I was into. <laughs> yeah, four on the floor. Yeah, yeah. Um, I still do a lot of stuff like that. It's fun. That's you know? cool, man. Um, you know, you you get two TB303s together and, a, and, a, and an 808 or a 909 yeah. uh, kick going and there you go there you go you've yeah. already created a song you know what i mean the story um, of the td3 is or is it tb or td uh tb tb303 yeah. how it was like considered junk oh and, yeah and then and then the techno scene just went give us that junk and man yeah. how iconic someone someone said the, iconic i shouldn't be using it man but i'm using it for that because it is iconic it, it is. created the whole techno industry yeah, because the Detroit underground scene grabbed a hold of that thing and they were like, ooh, you know, mm -hmm. because it is unique. Um, it's a very unique sound. Um, a lot of people hate it. But I will tell you, um, I was watching um, Woody from Woody's Piano Shack. Yeah. And um, he just bought a bunch of gear. I can't wait to see what he does with it. He's a cool guy. He's cool. And uh, and um, he... Um, he got a, he got a couple of TB uh, TD three hundred threes or the TD three the Behringer ones. He got two of them, mm -hmm. and I messaged him and I said, "Well, you don't have to, you don't have to make it sound like an acid song. The the the, the TB three hundred three or the TD three, you can actually get some cool bass sounds out of." And he yeah. was like, "Yeah," he says, "I'm going to give that a shot." Um, so he answered me back, which was really cool. Um, but yeah, you don't have to use it like in an acid or four on the floor kind of no. thing. No, even when you I know. when I picked up that RD6 too, I had an expectation in my head. And then when I started messing with it, I was like, oh. Yeah. Because yeah, everyone's got their own style. Yeah. Every and it's funny, like as soon as you know you you talk to somebody about a drum machine, even today, you know, in 2024, people immediately go to ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like, no, man, it's more to drum machines than that. Like even the edge, um, I had a deep I had a DFAM and I had a Mother 32 and I had a um uh a sub fatty. Yeah. Uh those were my Moog connection pieces that I mm -hmm. had. Um I gotta be I gotta be honest with you. I, I know that this edge is supposed to be a clone of the DFAM. I'm getting more out of the edge than I got out of the DFAM. Man, I I I think the edge is awesome and it looks wicked too. Yeah, it's it's a cool synth. Um and it's there built. Are, it's built like a tank too, right? Yeah, it's solid. Yeah, the yeah. knobs are solid. The switches are solid. Behringer makes uh -oh. solid stuff. Let's be honest. Yeah, they do. It's you know, uh, but you know, I God I, bless Uli. You know what, man? If I could meet Uli, I I would. I'd like to take him out to lunch. Man, I'd like to have <laughs> Uli. If we could get Uli on the synth fighter, three of us talking, John. Listen, I think Uli, what would you call Uli? Would you call Uli a disruptor? Would you call Uli a guy with a dream? What made Uli say, what made Uli say, I'm going to put out synthesizers that are high quality, sound great, and are, I think they're beyond affordable. Yeah. They're so affordable that it's almost hard to not just keep buying them. Well, Do you I know? mean, the thing about Uli is that he was a keyboard player. Um, and I think starting with the deep mind, yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen the original keyboard that he built. Nope. Haven't seen it. Could it's have freaky seen. looking. You should definitely check it out, man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think he always wanted to buy synthesizers from what I understood. I saw an interview with him and it's on YouTube. Anybody can look it up. Um, and he said he always wanted to build synthesizers, but I guess because, I don't know. His dad was involved with the company at some point or something. And that's not where they were, they were going. They were heading more towards like audio gear and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, and because I remember back in the day with Behringer, all they had uh, back then where they did the big uh, Euro desks, mm -hmm. they did the, um, they did a lot of outboard gear. Yeah. Uh, I had, I had a, a, a compressor by them. 
I had this, this was killer. Like everybody raved about this digital delay multi effects unit. Yeah. Um, and back then even it was like, that was like 120 bucks, you know? Um, and it was rack mountable and it's not, it's clean. It sounded great. Um, even like Behringer's boards, I've had several Behringer boards, mixing boards. I got a Behringer mixer, man, and I'm happy enough with it. Like, but again, like where I'm so new, I guess I wouldn't be able to be like, this isn't putting out the most primo sound. But well, the funny thing is, is, is back then people said that Yuli ripped off Mackie. Yeah. Because he was using the sealed pots. Um, but if you got to build a mixer, I'm like, like what? Okay, so is Chevrolet <laughs> ripping off Ford because they got four wheels on the car and, and exactly. windows and an engine? Like at some point, this nonsense has to be put aside because there's no point to argue if it's no if it's if it's uh, deceitful for them to be cloning things. Like when they went and cloned Arturia's swing key step clone. Yeah, you remember that. Okay, is that stepping over the line? That what, was. What do you think? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say yes on that one. I, when I saw the swing, I was like, okay. I go, <laughs> that's that's kind of like blatant, blatant ripoff, right? Yeah, there. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, yeah. Okay, so well, okay, so one out of fifty. Yeah, one out of fifty. That's not I bad. Mean, you know, when they did the edge and they did the crave, um, you know, everybody's like, oh, well, he shouldn't have done that because, you know, Moog is still making the DFAM and the Mother 32. I said, yeah, but they're different. Yeah. There's yeah, definitely yeah. differences between them. I own them. Yeah. And I, like I said, I've, I've used, I've used the edge more than I ever used the DFAM because there's something about the sound of this thing, man. And the, and the way it reacts, it's the DFAM. I, you guys, somebody who owns D fans are going to be like, I can't believe he said this. It was kind of sterile to me. Dude, I've um, heard some people say that Edge is better than the D fam too. I just, you know, um, what's his name? Um, Starsky. Yeah. Uh, he's, he loves the Edge. You know, and you, uh, listen, Starsky, I want to give Starsky credit. He's one of my favorite. Uh, yeah, me too. He's gear amazing. guys. He didn't, he didn't, uh, and guess what? If Behringer's paying, it doesn't matter, but he didn't abandoned Behringer. He still covered Behringer yep. because guess what? The guy's super talented. He makes amazing videos. If you want to watch a comparison video between a DFAM and an Edge with the oscilloscope there and he's checking the frequencies, man, there's nobody, if you ask me, there's nobody better than him at that. Yeah. For that I type totally of video, agree. you know? And his whole, his whole demeanor too. He's very friendly. He's, he's very, chill, man. He's, he's Brit. He's chilled out Brit. Yep. He's cool. Yeah. Um, he was on Sonic State a while ago. Um, I enjoyed that a lot. Sonic State, I don't know, man. It's tend to it's 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 starting to. I I said this to you before. I said I said it, it feels like it's going downhill. I don't know what's going on with it. I miss the big hitters, man. I miss. Um, I just Ty, feel, I feel like they're in a rut. Irwin. They're sitting in a rut. It's a little yeah. bit of a rut. It's this is what I was saying to you earlier. They're not they're not fired up anymore. It no. seems like if something, okay, this is the way I can describe it. And this isn't like any hate. I love Sonic State. I love, I love the channel. I love the website. Yeah. And I watch everything they do, but just as an observation, as a viewer, it seems like the gas tank is on E and they're not pumped anymore. No, they're not pumped up and they're not pumped up to the point. A lot of times where it's like, it doesn't even seem like you guys even like talking about this. Why are you picking this? Okay, if at, why are you picking this topic if the five people on the panel don't like the topic? Right. You know, I, that's what. Yeah, I, and maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's just the topics they're picking. They're going for uh, like what's trending in the software. You know, I don't know what they're doing. Well, I liked I liked the fact like when he had he had Rich on uh, from Pittsburgh Modular. A couple yeah, of times. that was that awesome. Was cool. Yep. Um, they and had like Heimbach told, and uh, yep. Mom's Mom. What is the other guy? Mom, look, no uh, computer guy. No, that was yeah. that was super interesting too, man. Yeah, I mean, and that was cool. But like the other thing I used to love when he had Dave Spears on from G Force, uh, and he had Ty Irwin. Ty Irwin's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a he's a definite Behringer hater. He hates Behringer, but I liked watching those guys because I learned things from them. Yeah, because they're um, smart. They're super, super, super smart, smart guys, and like um, next level. Yeah, and Nick, you know Nick Bat. I I I wrote a couple of articles back in in the uh, the early '90s for uh, Sonic State before there was a YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, 
and I did a couple of uh, 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 reviews on on gear. I did a, you're gonna love this one, the Insonic Fismo, um, <laughs> very cool synthesizer. I owned it. Oh, the Insonic. Uh, yeah, the Fismo. It was a purple and it was very spacey looking. I saw and, uh, that, man. I watched some demos on that. I got a little. I got an Insonic kick for a while. Yeah, it was a very cool synthesizer. Um, transient, transient waveforms. That's what they called mm -hmm. it. Um, I really liked it a lot. Um, but then, you know, I ended up getting divorced from my first wife, and I sold a bunch of gear and blah, yada yada. Yeah. And that was one of them that, that went, unfortunately. Now I can't, it's $4,000, dude, to buy one of those. I checked out the Fismos. And what's the other, the SQ1 or? Uh, SQ1, yeah. SQ1. Those those synths just had some insane movement. They were interesting. In the patches. It was like yeah. really, almost like it, it reminded me of the third wave. Some of the stuff I've heard of the third wave. Yep. You third know, wave's cool. I love the third wave. It was like I, the desktop. If I could get a hold of that big blue, so but, expensive. Ah, uh, what is it? Thirty five hundred bucks, man. Yeah, Come it's not on. cheap. When Hydrosynth Deluxe? Have you played a Hydrosynth Deluxe yet? I played a Hydros. I played all the Hydrosynths at Nam, and yeah. that was see. That was the thing. I'm like Hydrosynths, Osmos. Yeah, yeah, Hydrosynth, yeah, 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 Osmos. Yeah. So and I ended up getting the Osmos. You go with the Osmos to trade off. And it, I feel like the Osmos is something, if, if it holds up, you'll have that forever, you know? And one question about the Osmos, can you import patches? Yes. Or is it standard with what it got? You can import stuff? Yes, but the problem is, as I, I mentioned this to you before when we were chit-chatting last night, was, dude, the software? Yeah. Expressive E needs to come up with something for the software, man, because that software is a nightmare. It's they like sh they should just open source it then. Open source I, it and yeah, let, I, let, I, like, I, let I opened up it up and looked at it and was like, no. Do you? Uh, we got a we got a we got a, count, we got a countdown of four minutes going on here, so we'll clue it up in four minutes. You think? Yeah, real yeah. quick. I yeah. I just wanted to say something. So, what I found was very interesting about the three. Um, the three uh Korg synthesizers, yeah. the, the the state and the the six and the and the mod wave. Um I found out something very interesting. Apparently there's a is it either a Adreno board or a um uh what's the other little uh computer? Um Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi. Yeah. That's what's in those. Dude, I heard that too. And well, Nick Bat proved it. I guess him and Gaz Williams cracked one open um that's interesting so isn't it it's very interesting because here we are talking vst versus hardware yeah and, <laughs> and it's this a, a v vst stuck in that thing man. i know three vsts <laughs> I, I i always said i wish they came out with the uh called it like the tidal wave and they came out with all three of those in one thing yeah. You know, because when they put out the big SE for the Wave State and the Op 6, there was so much real estate. Imagine you had the three boards in that thing. And dude, you could sell be... that. You could sell it for three grand. People would be like, wow, I think anyway. Yeah. Well, look at that modular uh, keyboard. I forget who makes it. Um... What, the Nifty Keys? Yes, Nifty Keys. Yeah, yeah. That thing's cool. It's cool, like man. It... Even, even if they took the Korg modules now that they just came out with, and they did a MIDI controller where you could just, and they just kept a huge dump in the back where you could lay them in there. Yeah. And then on the back, you just MIDI it in. Yeah. They put a, a row of MIDI things along the back, MIDI keyboard, MIDI those in, you just got the whole board. That would be so cool. Because when I was at NAMM, they had those in glass cases. Yeah. Um, and they were like, you know, it was kind of like, they called it a concept. And I saw, so I was talking to one of the Korg reps um, and I said to him, I said, so this is going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And and he was like, well, and they were gold, gold and silver, like shiny chrome gold and silver. Yeah. Um, and he was like, he was like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, yeah, this is going to happen. And then like a year or two later, they came out with the bigger versions like that. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I, I would have bought the modules instead of the keyboards. I think if I get a chance, I'm going to, I'm going to sell them. I'll, I'll switch out for the modules. I don't ever want to get rid of them, but I'll switch out for the modules because I just feel like. Well, it's it's space, man. It's space, but I kind of yeah. like the Op6 keyboard because of the sequencer. But I probably would switch it because when I live jam, I, I basically the only keyboards I play are the Hydrosynth, 
op six and the mono poly. And then yep. I and then I MIDI out of the op six into both the mod wave and the wave state. And then yep. any sequence I set up on the op six triggers those sounds that I choose out of there. And I feel like that's a match made in heaven, you know? Yeah, absolutely. All right, hold on. Let's reboot this. Let's reboot right. it. It's gonna die. Cool. Hold on. I'll be back one sec. All right. Okay. Little intermission here while we reboot again because we're not paying for the uh the primo copy here, all right? Let's see, let's see. They're saying I gotta wait nine minutes, man. That's crazy. They're gonna make me wait nine minutes to reboot this chat? That can't be, that can't be legit. Come on, man. What about, let's see, how you guys enjoying it? You enjoying the uh, podcast so far? I think it's pretty decent. It's working out pretty good, having a good time. Let me see if I can load this back up here. Yeah, it seems like we're jacked for nine minutes, man. I don't know. That's kind of weak. Very, very weak. Let me see if I can uh, get him in this way. Nine minutes. Nine minutes. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think it's going good, man. I, I'm actually really enjoying it. Synth Dojo. So what I'm thinking about the Synth Dojo is I got it all mapped out. I got it I got it gamed out, and I'm away a couple weekends, and then I'm going to come back, and maybe we'll get it started. So we'll get it started with during the weeks. Maybe this – we'll see. Sunday night. Sunday night I'll do a live stream, I think. And then we'll get the Discord set up. Everyone can set up their band camps. And then we'll give everyone a week or two to get going. Yeah, I'm going to use Discord. Can you video on Discord? Way better than SS. Yeah, so then we'll get that set up. And then once everyone got their band camp set up and everyone's got their stuff ready to go, we'll just start one track a week. And then we'll check it out just like that. So we'll see what happens anyway. What do you guys think, man? Yeah, this, this is fun, man. I like talking to people. I'm half thinking, like, when we get this show going, Synth Fighter Podcast, anyone can come on and, and, and talk the job. Because what, what we're trying to do, man, is just have, like, a community of people like us who can come on, talk. All of us, well, not me. I, I think I don't have really any knowledge. But all you guys are so knowledgeable. It's absolutely insane. The skill level everyone has on synthesizers, the knowledge and all that, it's just mind-blowing. So we'll just switch it up. We'll get some guests going. Maybe we'll do it. Maybe we'll do it once a week. Maybe we'll do it once a month. I don't know. We'll we can see. What do you guys think? What is like a non burnout amount of time to do this? Because if you did it every day, you'd probably be like, no thanks. You did it once a week, you'd be like, this is cool. You did it once a month, you'd be like, maybe I miss it. What do you think about that? Love your energy, man. Let's uh let's get this going. See if uh, he wants to come back on. See here, you wanna come on? All right, so while that's going on, let's just go over here and uh, put this on for your guys' listening pleasure. This is like a little intermission, maybe. Just grab two a month. That's good. Bi weekly. All right, bi weekly. Well, that's what we'll do bi weekly podcast. All right, so that's what we're doing now. We'll do a bi-weekly one if I can. Get some guests on. Oh, you didn't miss it. We're going to get on back in a minute. We just had, because I didn't know you had to pay for Zoom. I thought it was free, but you know, we'll get it out. We'll get it going here again and get them back on because you got to wait. You got a nine minute intermission you got to do here. It's kind of strange, man. Let's see what it says. Six minutes to go, baby, before Echo's back. Bi-weekly sounds good. Who would you guys like to see on the Synth Fighter podcast, man? Who who would you like to see? Come on, man. I think you, we can do a three. We can do a four. We could do a two. Maybe we could even do a one, man. Yeah, bi-weekly is good, man, because I got, I got too much stuff. I think I may be doing too much stuff, man. Am I just like kind of... I, I got the shilling going on. I got the gas station. I'm just messing around playing, so... 
Some people seem to really like the shilling, which was interesting. Now, I just did that for a kind of a joke and fun, but people seem to like it. Change the chat all versus top. How do you do that? All versus top. Let me see if I can do that real quick. Chat. All versus top. Oh, okay, hold on. Let's see. All messes visible. How about that? Is that better? All messages visible? Seemed like it worked. Yeah. Maybe we'll get old. Uh... Everyone says they want they want to know what's going on with synth punk. I don't know. Synth punk is elusive. He's hard. He's hard to locate sometimes. You know, he pops up and then he disappears. So some people want to hear from him. Want to see what he's doing. Calc from Novation, that'd be cool. I was thinking about asking if the guy who just made that pedal, The Swarm, which is on Kickstarter, I did a video early. Uh, seeing if he wants to come on and talk about that pedal, because I thought that was super cool. Let's watch that while we're waiting here. Let's see here. Let's check this out. We got the web. Let's go check it out over here. Check this out, man. Let's reboot this. Introducing the Swarm from Ardium Instruments. The Swarm is a desktop So this is a new pedal called the Swarm 8 voice a full featured arpeggiator in 8 note polyphony. The oscillator core is comprised of 7 detunable saw waves capable of playing 8 notes in poly mode or an arpeggiated sequence in arp mode. Built into the Swarm are four effects: a syncable delay, a stereo reverb, a stereo chorus, and a freeze effect all of which can be used independently with other instruments via inputs on the back. Controlling the swarm is easy. Simply connect your MIDI controller via USB cable and start creating. Isn't this now cool? Now let's hear some sound examples of the swarm in action. 379 bucks. Doesn't that sound cool, man? Freeze mode. It's got delay, chorus, reverb, arpeggiator. Super, super powerful little thing. You can run your synths into it as an effects box too.
All right. We're back, baby. Just gotta send him a link. So, I mean, that's... That's a cool synth. Very, very cool synth. I know it'll fall through your keyboard, but man, it's it's cool. You can't you can't say that ain't cool, man. That's and three hundred and seventy nine dollars to back that Kickstarter. I think that's a good deal. Very, very good deal. Hello. What's up, man? Back in action. The video geared up. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Nothing to it, man. We got a little uh, a little pause in the action. That's the beauty the beauty of live TV, isn't it? Absolutely. All right, so all right, there we go. I had some little tunes going, just shooting off in the chat, man. Everyone seems to be enjoying the uh, enjoying the podcast so far, man. I'm having a good time. Are you? Yeah, absolutely. It's just Dude, so we talk. We're talking about gear. Like, what I'm having a good time when you're not talking about gear, right? I mean. It's just so fun. I don't know, man. And it, maybe it's a weird thing, but talking about it, playing, it's just the synthesizer genre. And you're a music. I'm not a musician. I only started playing synthesizers in like 2018 or 19 or something, right? So you're a musician. I guess so. Maybe you know. I, I got right. I got imposter I'm, syndrome to the max, but well, I'm gonna you know. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, share something with you. So. I read this book a long time ago called The Artist's Way. Yeah. Um, it was very enlightening. It was very difficult to get through because it brought up a lot of things in the past and a lot of uh, emotional things that you experience as you get older and as you're a child. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in the book that always I thought was very interesting because she keeps, the author keeps mentioning this throughout the book. And that is that every child when they're born is an artist interesting no matter no matter how you look at it yeah you know when they're drawing or they're singing in a choir or you know in music class and they're banging on a little little tambourines and stuff and, and they ring the artist that he is, as you go eh? the everybody's an artist everybody can draw everybody and she talks about this and then she touched on something that i thought this is the the key feature to this whole thing is she said but somewhere along the line, somebody tells you, in not a mean of meaning way, like mean, you know, mean mm -hmm. way or in a, you know, in a derogatory way, mm -hmm. that you're not any good or you're not doing it right or um, stay between are, the lines. Here's the guardrails. Yes, this is how exactly. you do it. Not that. Exactly. And she called those people shadow artists. Ooh. And. I always thought that was interesting and I always keep it in the back of my head because I remember the first time I ever did a CD uh, with a friend of mine uh, that actually got played on Discovery Channel and uh, Muga's, Omni, Muga's Omni Theater uh, plays it sometimes in the, in, the, um, in the Omni Theater during intermissions and I was called Pangea. And, um, cool name too, very, man. Very synth synthetic uh, stuff, very 80s all digital everything was digital i had an a cog m1 oh yeah um, and i had this guy we were invited to this party um and there was this guy that was there that we knew his name was Corey. he were he used to work for sweetwater actually mm -hmm. um so everybody had like this cd party for us uh because we had just released this cd and so you know, we, everybody's talking to us and, you know, we we're kind of, we were like the, the main attraction. People wanted to talk to us. Yeah. Um, so we're talking and people are saying, Hey, I really love the CD. It sounds great. Blah, blah, blah. And this guy comes out of nowhere and he says, well, I would have played this part like this, the way you did it just didn't sound right. And my buddy Dave looked at him and he said, Oh, really? And your studio is where? And you have what gear? Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, I don't have a studio. And he goes, Dave goes, well, when you get a studio and you start writing your own music, you can create what you want to create. But right now, this is what we did. That's an interesting and thing. I feel like music is a lot more open to shadow criticizers than like painting or something too, you know, because- Big time. Yeah. 
<laughs> and that's and that's when I I it happened, you know, and it, and when it happens to you though, you you kind of get put back by it. You kind of like, well, what do, you know? Well, it's like it's it's energy vampirism, right? Yes. They're just like, um, yeah, exactly. Give me some of those good vibes. And I, you know, and then when I read the uh, the artist way, I related that story right to that, and I said that was a shadow artist. That was somebody who was probably told by somebody else when he was younger because the baton just keeps getting passed. Yeah. It's like a, you know, it's a program that's put in place. It's a virus. When you're told that you shouldn't play anymore, basically. Right. When you're told playtime is over as a child, as you're moving into the other years, once playtime's over, that's when the shadow people like you're calling them kind of well, like, well, yeah. I mean, I mean, the other thing too, man, is like, you know, you have, you know, when I, when I was, when I was growing up, it was like, you know, okay, Jay, you know, you're a drummer in a band and you're on tour and what are you going to do with mm -hmm. your life? Mm -hmm. Well, you're on, you're on tour. I'm on tour. What are you, I'm doing my life. What are That's you what I'm about? doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's <laughs> well, always like, got, what are you doing? Yeah. Instead you gotta of just back. like, wow, it's cool what you're doing. You know, what are you exactly. doing? It's like always implanting this, uh, this, this anxiety uh, program for future. What are you exactly. going to do? And when you have, like, when you think about what you're going to do, that creates anxiety, right. you know, just, just like as when you think back, oh, I should have done that. It creates depression. So like Correct. when you get out of this momentary, when, you, cause it's all we got is the moment anyways, when you leave the moment, man, you're venturing out into some dangerous territory where, you know, over there is like, the anxiety force and over there is you know the, the pit of depression that you're going to right. spill into because it doesn't really even exist if you think about it in a weird way it, yep. it happened but it's just like man how many times have you thought about stuff and been like did that even happen oh yeah wow and that's and that's the thing so that's the, so getting back to what i was saying about you is that you're like well you know you're an artist and you know I'm, i just got in no dude you're an artist you started painting your, your canvas is, is in front of you and you started painting and creating. That's the way I look at the music. That's the way I look at everything. You know, I, I took up painting for a while when, when, uh, when my daughter was born and, and, um, I, I started watching that guy there, uh, Bobby the happy little clouds. Bob yeah. Ross, yeah. <laughs> and I learned how to, I learned how to paint with a knife and, and, uh, Ooh, and it was interesting. Yeah. And I yeah. actually, I did some pretty decent paintings. Um, you know, I, and then I started drawing. I, I can't draw for the life of me, but what I'm trying to say is, you know, when you put yourself out there and you're doing something that you love to do because it's a passion, you have a passion for it. Don't sell yourself short and say, well, you're an artist. I'm really not, you know? Yeah, you are. Yeah, it's, you a, have... it's a weird thing, isn't it, man? It's a weird well, thing. Well, dude, you've got tools. You look at the tools you have, your palette, your palette is filled with colorful knobs and buttons and you know what I mean? And it's like, and that's what I try telling younger musicians, like, you know, just be who you are and just enjoy it. Don't try to make money from it. Don't try to, because I've been through that route too, where it became a job mm -hmm. um, and the passion was gone. Isn't you know? that interesting? As soon as you attach a financial uh, anchor to it, 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 uh, it, the energy the the energy you have for the creation now is energy for the money yes it's like I, this energy has to get me this dollar whereas before it was like this energy is just to get a cool sound or spend some good time with my buddies chilling playing instruments or right fill in the blank with whatever you got as soon as you attach money man it's like yeah it's it's and the thing is is you know all of a sudden you also get to the point where um, it becomes pressure, you know, pressure. Uh, pressure, you got to, you've got to, you've got to create well, Dead, deadline well, or yeah. self-imposed deadline. Exactly. It's like, I don't want to create, like I was signed to a label. Um, it was a friend of mine and, um, he's, it's a big Hispanic label actually, uh, does a lot for, um, uh, bachata music. Mm -hmm. Um, my brother from another mother. That's what I call my buddy, Manny. Mm -hmm. um, and he has a label. And it's very successful. He's done documentaries and everything. Um, so he said, hey, man, he said, can you write music like this? And at the time, Stranger Things had come out. Yeah. 
And he heard the theme to Stranger Things. And I said, dude, I could do that stuff in my sleep. Yeah. And and he was like, well, I'll tell you what, you come up with, you know, five songs and maybe I'll sign you to the label. Oh, like, okay. challenge. So I did. I did them literally in two days. And he's like, Dance. And, I, and I sent them actually 10 songs. Yeah. And And he was like, are you serious? And I go, yeah. So he listened to him. He said, wow, man, this is really good. And that was the first Echo Craft album. Dude, that's um, sweet. And, but then, and Manny, if you're watching this, because I know you watch a lot of the things that I do. Oh, you got to send it to Manny, in. man. <laughs> um, Manny started doing Shadow Out of stuff with me. Um, he told me that my first album was the best I could ever do. Um, and that was it, man. I said, no, mm -mm. We're, we're friends. I don't want to break. Uh, uh, what, 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 do you mean, what, do you, what do you mean? He started doing shat reverse shadow artists or he was like, your first album was great. This here is come on. I need you to pick it up a little bit is what he said. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't like anything I produced after that. He, Ooh, he, um, interesting. And then he didn't like my album covers cause I did all my own artwork yeah. and he started wanting to do his album covers on my album covers. Yeah. And, um, so that's when I, you know, it, it was hard because, you know, when you're in a partnership like that with somebody, it's, it's any relationship, relationships are hard, you know, relationships are hard, man. Partnerships are hard. Friendships are hard. It's yep. all just, it's a wild yeah. ride of humility and ego. It really is. You know, it's, and I, and I, 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 I said to him, I said, look at man, I said, and I talked to people, I had a group of friends, I kept saying stuff like, this is really bumming me out. I don't want to hurt his feelings. He's going to get mad at me, blah, blah, blah. And it just went on and on and on until finally somebody said to me, Jay, just do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I called him up and we met and I said, look, dude, I, I got to go on my own. I go, you're poisoning me right now. And, um, and, I was, and so this thing now can spoil a friendship. Yes. Right. This pressure or finance or whatever you guys had going on with the business partnership or the music partnership now well, the, has well, the ability to spoil the friendship. Well, the, the pressure, too, that was interesting was um, he would do new release dates every Friday. So he told me I had to have a new piece of music every Friday. Um, and I thought it was fun in the beginning. I'm like, oh, cool. This is great. Like, but then like when I started getting criticized and stuff, all of a sudden that mental block would come in and I'm like, well, wait a minute, I'm not pleasing him. I'm not, he doesn't like what I'm doing. Isn't, um, isn't that crazy that like, okay, so. I was and thinking, he writes music. Yeah. He does ambient stuff. So do you think in this weird kind of way that when the shadow people speak to you in the criticizing way that is kind of like energy vampirism that we're talking about it's almost like them sending an lfo through you you know it's like them sending an lfo through no your it's vibe. like them closing the, it's like them closing the filter <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 oh yeah closing the filter or right. <laughs> cranking the resonance where your eardrums just bust so check this out someone in the comments just mentioned uh this book have you read this what is it? I can't. So it's called uh, The Creative Art, A Way of Being by Rick Rubin. Oh, Rick Rubin's book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been wanting to read that, actually, to dude, be honest with you. Dude, uh, who just said about that? It was, uh, anyway, someone just mentioned it. The Korean, well, the Korean Jesus. Of... The Korean Jesus. This is nuts, dude. And you probably know tons of it in there. But when you read it, you know how, like, you're talking about sometimes... Uh, blocks just fall into place. You're like, oh, 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 you know, you, awesome book. Anybody in the chat who hasn't got it, get it is wicked. And what was the book you yeah. just said? Yeah, I, I'm going to definitely check that out. I, cause I, I watched some videos with Rick Rubin um, and how he, cause he does a lot of philosophy stuff too. Yeah. Um, and I was, at first I was just like going, okay, man, what, you know, what's this guy doing? He's a producer. He's, you know, and then I started listening to him. I'm going, Wow, that really makes sense. Yeah, and his whole idea behind everything is crazy. There's only one thing about this book I don't like, bro. And uh, see if I can find it real quick. It was... I'll find it in a minute. Anyways. Yeah, I'll well, find the it. That, the book that Go I on. was talking about was called The Artist's Way, and it's a workbook also. So you have to work through things. It's, Who wrote it's it? It's not some... 
Um, oh my God, I forgot her name. Somebody in the chat, anybody know the artist way? The artist um, way. But but uh I don't recommend that you do it by yourself. Uh most people that do it, they do it in a group or with another person. Mm -hmm. I did it by myself and I I I got very emotional at times. And uh, it's it's uh, also it's heavy, it goes, eh? So you gotta work uh, through it too, huh? Yeah, it goes deep. Um, but it helped. Um, Interesting. You know, and I, I, it got me to the point where I broke away from my inner turmoil of being a musician. Interesting. So what, um, what, what was the breakaway point where you're like, I got to just. Well, you know, we talked about martial arts yeah. and, um, you know, I, I, I took about six or seven years of my adult life as a martial artist. Um, always wanted to do karate as a kid, but never had the, uh, the gall to do it. And mm -hmm. So I started and I, um, I actually enjoyed it, uh, enjoyed it a lot. And, um, yeah. I, I started taking that stuff that I did from, got from the artist way and implying it, uh, applying it to what I learned in, in, uh, in martial arts. And my sensei was really amazing. Um, you know, he talked about mind, body, and spirit, and, mm -hmm. uh, it was really cool. And I, I learned a lot about myself, but that inner turmoil of, creation mm -hmm. um i was th there was like you know uh there was like kung fu fighting going on in my head yeah <laughs> um and so because you're, you're you're battling your inner shadow pretty much yeah yeah I, you know everything i did was horrible everything i did didn't sound good enough everything i did you know i was being a perfectionist about it um and it, it's crippling when you it's do horrible that. man isn't it it's like it is it's like such a crazy frequency to be, and man, you're saying this to yourself. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Which hurts the most. Yeah. And you know, because you, way, you'll always protect yourself with your ego to be like, man, you don't know what you're talking about. This is awesome. But when, you, when you're in your head saying it to yourself, man, yeah. that's the most damaging, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, it, 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 so when it came to like, you know, earning a belt or getting, you know, doing my cotters and stuff like that, you know, my teacher was like, He's like, Jay, no, you know, you don't have to do worry about anybody watching you because mm -hmm. they're going to get up and do this too. Yeah. And I know that sounds simple and stupid, but, but it's legit. it made sense to me because it was like, oh, okay, well, nobody else is in this room with me. Mm -hmm. Why am I being so hard on myself? <laughs> it's crazy. You know? Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's like, you gotta, it's like, you gotta like also start talking back to that person, you know? Oh you, yeah. You gotta be because guess what? If someone was like saying that to your missus, you'd be like, hey, bud, I don't fuck, I don't think so, man. You back up. Don't you ever speak to my my missus like that. Yep. But so you almost gotta take that same approach with the shadow man in your head being like, no, no, you ain't talking to Echo like that, baby. That's right. <laughs> ain't happening. Get out of here. And that's and that's you know, and that's what it is. Like, no matter like what I do now, um, occasionally you get right as block. And when I, when that happens to me now, I just, I stop everything mm -hmm. and I go do something else. Yeah. And just re uh, reboot I, later. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a video gamer. I love video games. I've been playing since Pong. Yeah. Um, I mean, my generation invented video games, but I mean, what are you, you, know, what are you playing these days? What's the go-to? Uh, I was actually playing, um, uh, contract sniper. Ooh. Uh, I like yeah. sniper games. Uh. <laughs> I used to like a game, uh, Metal Gear Solid. I played a lot of that. Oh, Love Metal, Metal Gear, Gear Solid. Solid. Splinter Cell. My, you remember Splinter Cell? Oh, yeah. My, my, my Call of Duty shirt on right now. So Sweet, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's another thing that uh, gaming and synthesizers and all these kind of problem-solving puzzle, puzzle-esque. Like synthesizers, to me is like putting together a puzzle yeah, and, and then a puzzle that you can manipulate into a different picture. So once you get the puzzle put together, you're like, Ooh, I can turn this Phoenix into a, you know, into a, a, a warthog here, you know, right. Just with a couple turns and you can ruin it. And do you ever do that? you put, you got oh, something yeah. going and you ruin it. <laughs> and then you're like, man, I got to pull this back out. And you try. My yeah. My favorite thing is if I do something really late at night, and my wife's sleeping and I'm, you know, cause she's down the hallway and I'm, 
I'm doing something and I got my headphones on and I'm thinking it sounds great. Yeah. And I go to bed and then the next day I wake up and it sounds like there was bugs in my head. I'm like, what oh, was yeah, I yeah. thinking, man? Yeah, you know, yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, Cause you, you get lost in the zone. Oh yeah. <sighs> yeah. And the other thing too, like, you, you know, when you're like experimenting with sound, um, like when I was messing with the wasp last night, um, I just got lost in it. I just started, I didn't even record anything. I was just like, I was coming up with some really interesting sounds and I'm like, this is crazy. You know what I mean? Like, but I, and that, you know, that's another thing I used to get so emotionally distraught about that. Like, Oh man, what a waste of time. Yeah. What, I know. So stupid. Should have recorded it. Yeah. But you or know you'll what? go back and try and you just can't. But what I learned about that was no, man, it's like, it's like a sculptor, you know, he's getting used to molding the clay. He's getting used to the chisel. He's getting, so that's the way I look at the instrument. It's like, I'm it's like learning. martial arts. It's like martial arts. You're it's just like training your jab. You're training, you know, you're training your takedown. You yep. know, you're not sparring every single time you get in there, you know? Yep. That's how I look yeah, at synthesizers man. exactly like martial arts, the exact way. And the whole live jamming aspect of martial art or uh, synthesizers when you're playing by yourself, I look at that like, like when I hit record and then live jam, that's like a live sparring session. You're sparring with you're someone. You're sparring yeah. now, you know, you're like, okay, the pressure's on. I got, okay, I don't want to screw. So it's like a little different than just turning everything off and where you're just kind of shadow boxing with yourself, just, you know, going through the motions, just getting your skills yep. down. So it's cool. See, that's cool, man. See, that's a cool way to think, you know? And, and again, you might, you might get to the point where like, geez, nothing sounds right. And and for me now, when I do that, I just sit there and go, whatever. Yeah. Instead of going, oh, I suck. Yeah, I know. I used to do that a lot, man. I'd be like, I suck. Yeah, dude. Well, I look at it like, well, if I sucked, now I look at it, I go, well, if I suck at this, then why do I have all the stuff that I have? Well, why do I, why do, why was I successful at one thing when I was playing in bands or why, you know, when I had... I had some success with with writing uh, synthetic music for uh, a show that's on you know YouTube called BWT. Um, and su and suck and suck uh, in what context? The context that's you know so what does that even mean? It sucks well, or that suck? Uh, it's you know that, like what does that mean anymore? It I, doesn't I mean anything. At, right, I sucked as a musician. That's how I used to beat myself up. And yeah. then, but now it's just like, no, it just ain't happening. So I'm walking away. It just is no. too. Yeah. Like, and you just look at it as you actually had the opportunity to sit down and mess around with some super gear. It's humbling to even be around such equipment and it also really is. super grateful to even have the ability to have any gear, even though it takes forever to acquire and you've got to sacrifice and save up and all this kind of stuff. Yep. And if you have one piece of gear, you have a hundred pieces of gear, man, it's, it's a hobby to me that I wish I could explain to someone who's not into it. And it's a similar as <laughs> martial arts. You just can't explain it. And nope. it, it just, it, it's undescribable once you get your head wrapped around a bunch of sounds, you know, and you're like, wow, this is, this is just amazing. And then you, you have the ability to manipulate it too. Right. In any, well, a, in any genre. Well, that's the thing you get to manipulate things like, manipulating sound is like it's it's like i said i try i you know I, I tried my hand at painting and i did pretty pretty good at it and um you know and and being able to spread the paint with the knife mm -hmm. and get a shape and get a, a a shadow or whatever um that's how i look at synthesizers like i you know you get to manipulate that sound mm -hmm. um i did a thing earlier on the mini log like i said and and um I got this bass sound. I never got out of that thing before. And I was like sitting there going, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. and I think, I think the more you experiment with anything, uh, the more, not just knowledge that you get, but the more inspiration you get from that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I, I hate to sound like, you know, we're, we're on this philosophy kick right now, but. No, but, but it's kind of, it's kind of like, it's bigger. It's, it's bigger than just, uh, sounds coming out of some plastic or metal cases you know there's something very very special it's organic it's organic man and it can put that's, you that's in this... the only way i can describe it. yeah it's crazy now see i on the other hand i can pick up a guitar right and 
I'm not a guitar virtuoso by any means. Like I said, I was yeah. an, originally, I was a drummer. I still am, but piano and keyboards to me are more pliable because piano is basically a percussion instrument. Mm -hmm. um, but I pick up a guitar and I love playing guitar, but I got to tell you, I know guys like this is a guy that I, 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 he does some tracks with me. His name's Adam Dallas. He's an unbelievable guitar player He's from Belfast, uh, Ireland. Mm -hmm. Um, and I met Al Adam through work and he's unbelievable. I mean, when I tell you he's the greatest guitar player I've ever played with this dude, effortless Ingve Ing Mumstein or any of those guys, he's right up there with them. I'm not mm -hmm. exaggerating. And, um, I can't play like that. I can't, I, I've, I've tried, I can't even try. I can't mm -hmm. even fathom, but he can. So the cool thing is, is I play some rhythm. I'll put some rhythm tracks down on my, on my music. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then I'll do some synth stuff and I'll send that to him and let him do Which his is magic. so fun to do, right? Yeah. You know, so, I mean, I'm never going to be like him on guitar, mm -hmm. right? I don't think he'll ever be and do what I I can do on synthesizers. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not his. That's well, not his bad. He'll never you know? be able to do what you do. That's the cool thing about all this kind of stuff. Like he could do synthesizers, right? But, but like I'm not gonna. I can't do what you do. You can't do what I do. I can't no. do what people in the chat can do. I can't do what the machines one. Do you ever check out the machines one channel? Yes. Oh my God, man! He put something out the other day. Uh, in his big Behringer setup, the gray one, I can't remember what it's called, the Behringer 2500, I think. Did you, oh, yeah, did yeah, you yeah. see it? Dude, it blew my mind. He just <laughs> had it on like a, a self-generating patch, and I think he called it like Alien Predator Space Patch or something. And I must have listened to it 10 times because I was just, and then I was like, I got to buy that whole setup, and then I got to get a hold of the machines one, <laughs> and I got to say, give me every single way you got that patched in there, and I'm just going to leave it like that. Just leave it on. Yeah, just leave it on on that sound, and then when I come in and turn it on off. But it was so crazy that you can – it's just insane. It's insane. Synthesizers yeah, I, and music and frequency, and it's all just so wild, man. It's such a fun, lifelong journey that just well, keeps you know, changing. You know what's interesting too, man, is like you – you know, I was never really big into ambient music, yeah. so I thought. Mm -hmm. um, but then – when I started creating it myself, all of a sudden I started listening to other people's stuff. I know. It's and cool. just get taken away. Like I, I did an ambient piece uh, that's going to be on my album. It's called uh, Corvos's Gate. Sweet. Uh, Cor Corvos is the Latin word for, um, for Raven. Mm -hmm. So it's called Raven's Gate. And so I, I did that all in the Osmos. Mm -hmm. It's one patch with Valhalla Shimmer on it. Wow. And it's just, and it's just, it just drones. And then every once in a while I come in with some heavy, uh, like a heavy lead over it. And then I stop and it just drones out. And, you know, I, I, when I was, and it's only a minute and a minute and 57 seconds. And I, I, I said, no, this is definitely going on the album because every time I listen to it, I say to myself, I should have made this longer. Uh, you know, that's the, I know, you know it, but yeah, but I just, you know, it's just, but it is. And look how awesome it is. It keeps you coming back and right. want to listen to it again and again. And my, just like, my friend Manny, who I was talking about with the record label, um, he does ambient music. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I, you know, he ended up buying some synthesizers and stuff and cause he always wanted to learn. And <clears throat> so he kind of went off on his own, did his own thing. And he came out with like three or four albums. Sweet. Um, dude. And I listen to his stuff because it mellows me out, man. I just, mm -hmm. I like it. You know, what, I tell what him all the time. What style is his? His ambient style? Complete ambient. Like a yeah. lot of droning. Every once in a while you'll hear like, he did this one called Silver Cloud. And it's like one of my favorite pieces because it's just like this real deep droning going on. But then every once in a while you'll hear like this piano in the background just kind of tinkling mm -hmm. in and, and it just takes you away. And I don't know, man. You can't do that with anything else. Like, you can't. Synthesizers, does it just does stuff like that. Dude, it's know? just... Uh, it, and and I'm, I'm a huge, I'm a huge, you know, uh, 
fan of classical music. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I love Mozart. I love Beethoven. I love, uh, uh, Copeland. I love, you know, Wagner. I love all these artists that I, you know, I read about, I studied, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of like, and that's one thing about classical music, man. It's, it's perpetual. It, it, no matter how old it is, cause it's ancient at this point. Yeah. And it's, it's, it still holds value. It holds water. Um, and that's what I'm hoping that the synthesizer world that we live in now, because things have changed since, since 19, when I was listening to music in 1990, mm -hmm. um, it was a lot of hardcore, like we were talking about trance and, and um, there was some ambient stuff out there, mm -hmm. but then you had like your craft works and you had, you know, it wasn't as diverse as it is now. I know. And kind of what we were saying earlier, and I think someone just said in one of the comments there, Hayes mentioned, it, I think he was like the, the, the diversity of skill and information that's on YouTube. So vast. That really doesn't get, uh, Cause you know it, dude, when you do live jams and that stuff, man, YouTube almost got like this corner over here where they yep. shuffle it all and they, they give it no, no, no push. And it's not like, no, you have to like explore YouTube to find things like we're talking about or people who like to, but it's so, it's so vast and there's so much to offer, man. It's just, once you start getting into the community and talking to people like, man, every, you, but you know, this something in your comments and stuff, people will have mind-blowing explanations for things. And this is like the business practices of Behringer overseas. This is how to set up modular. This is like the the exact human manual for the for the Rev2. You know, like right. There's absolute insane geniuses. And it's and it's just so cool to be able to get the, everybody interacting now. That's kind of what I'm I'm into like, and me and you talking like this is so, so interesting to be able to have people interacting on this type of level. Oh, it's great that are not just it's... flogging stuff at you, if you know what I mean. Right? Yeah. And, you know, it's and again, it's tied to money. Well, that's, <laughs> you know, that's the like, thing. You know, like like a lot of people like we were talking about earlier. You know, a lot of the big synth heads, like you said, they're losing either their passion or because they're not getting paid enough or their deadlines. And I just, Got to yeah, do it just, again. Not enough views, just, you know. Yeah, and I just sit there like, you know, if I if I reach out to somebody with one of my videos, I you know, you and I are both small channels, dude. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, but I'm not doing it for monetary reasons. I have a job. I'm going to be retiring soon. <laughs> it's like I'm not doing it to. I don't do it because pure love. Yeah, I like doing it. It's fun. Yeah. You know, and if I reach somebody and like, I've been getting comments, I got some great comments about the cat and, uh, and, uh, uh, great comments about the Behringer edge. And, you know, I immediately message them and say, Hey man, thanks for watching. Or, Hey, thanks. You know, Oh yeah, this is what I did. Or like, well, just me, think how cool this is, brother. How cool is it that when I talked to you last night on, um, when we were setting this up, bro, I think we might've been battling vampires, you know, 20,000 years ago, because there's this strange connection you have with people who are in this kind of zone, right? Same with martial yeah. arts. It's like this, it's like a brotherhood or whatever, you you know, it's a brotherhood yeah. and, a no, really. and a female hood and a whatever hood you want to call it. But it's a, it's a brotherhood <laughs> where, you, like we were saying before, you just don't know what it's like until you start experiencing the feeling of being, I guess, uh, in a good way, drowning in sound and frequency and all this kind of stuff. And to be able to have the ability to create, you can create yeah. worlds with your fingertips. It's just, it's, it's, it's almost like the closest thing you can get to creation, I guess, besides a woman giving birth. That yeah. might be extreme. But, you know, well, no, like, I mean, I, no, I get, I get like, you know, like I, I call my pieces baby. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, baby. Uh, it's, it's, it's my baby. I yeah. gave birth to it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's what Rick Rubin said in his book, how like he had an interesting idea where, or a uh, theory, he said that ideas are alive and they're everywhere. So you don't mm -hmm. get, you don't get ideas. It's not like you don't like, it's not like Echo is going to choose an idea. The idea chooses you. And then you have to decide if you're going to marry the idea right that's really and then cool, if you yeah. and then if you don't the idea moves on and that's why right. sometimes you'd be like man i thought of that and they went and did it it was like no 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 you didn't think about it. the idea said do you want to join me 
And you said, no, thank you. And it went over to the next person. Yep. That, so that's where he's saying, as soon as you start tapping in and get your antenna firing, it's like when your antenna's firing full tilt, ideas will just come flat out. It's kind of what he's doing. And, and I think we've all experienced that a little bit if if you really think about it, you know, when you're like, no, wow, how did I come up with that? Or That's true. I, I, I've actually, I've listened to other people's music. Sometimes I, I sit there and go, Hey, wait a minute. This sounds like one of my songs. Yeah. Or Jesus, I, that that's such a good riff, man. Why didn't I think of that? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. One of my one of my favorite uh musicians is Trent Reznor from uh from Nine Inch Nails. And what I loved about one time what he said was he's like, he's like, Yeah, man, I I I write symphony of, of noise. I write symphonies mm -hmm. of noise. I like that. And that just like clicked with me because you any there's music in everything mm -hmm. you know and, um and you see that I've, when people go sample the craziest stuff and then come in and like load it into their synths and yeah you know it's well, wild. I, I drive my i drive my wife crazy like i'll i'll be like well i'll be washing the pants mm -hmm. and the pan will hit something just right and i'll hear like a dong and i'll go Ooh. Ooh. you know <laughs> yeah yeah and she just looks at you me, just start goes, hearing something. sounds you start hearing sounds yeah. you're more mindful and they're coming you're like oh that's wow weird. she's like you're so weird and i'm like no i'm a musician you yeah. know what i mean it's just like sound is everywhere i you know controlled chaos is what the machines once said it's controlled I, chaos absolutely that's yeah. so cool it's the I truth love, i love i love when the synths overtake you that yeah. that moment where you're like no, no 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 don't lose it don't lose it don't lose it you know, and you're like, all right, turn the resonance down, or yeah, you got to, yeah, yeah, you're in deep, man. Yeah, because once you once you get those offset, sometimes you're like, ah, oh, it's it's gone. Oh no, oh no. And and that's another thing. Like I always now, um, if if you know, if I get a, an idea and I say to myself, and this is not just playing with synths. This is like all of a sudden I get this this thought in my head, like, okay, this I need to put this riff down now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you'll lose it. You'll yeah. lose it. And that's the wonderful thing about today, you know, with the technology that we have is being able to just do that. I, I, I open up logic, boom, I put it down. Even if I don't look at it for another 10 days, it's there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, when I was, when I was growing up, you know, I had a, my first recorder ever was a, was a, was a realistic, uh, cassette deck that my dad got me and i got a, i bought another one because i i learned how to bounce from tape to tape oh and yeah, I, yeah nice and I, it was like the first time i multi-track recorded with two cassette decks um and it was like you know you couldn't just get an idea in your head and then all of a sudden just throw it out there you had to set everything up and you know and then if it, it was too distorted on the microphone you had to bring the volume down and we're lucky you know, right I, now man it's it's a lucky oh time my God. it's so it's crazy it's, it's crazy it's almost supernatural the ability that you have now to do things it's awesome you know? it really is awesome so listen brother we're hitting the two minute warning again on the upgrade now setting so we are we are coming down to that wire let's call it a night man i i really enjoyed this man i gotta thank you Thank you a lot for connecting. You know, it's it's been an absolute blast, been a pleasure, and I'm Same sure here, we're going to do it again. This is a very good time. Seems like everyone else had a good time too, man. And you know, yeah. And I just want to say hi to everybody in the chat room. Um, you know, I appreciate it. We, you know, uh, Samurai and I have been trying to put this together, and we finally got it happening. So I'm very very going, excited. Man. A little bit very of effort, excited. but guess what? It's a two-man show. We're trying to get this working on. <laughs> you know, we don't got no tech crews or nothing behind the scenes here. This is. This it is, is it. what it is, you know? And I like I like the live style too, even though you might have to like run into some things. I like yeah. live. I like live. I like live. I do too. I do too. You know, um, I, I tried doing a, a a podcast with somebody and it just wasn't happening. I, you know, I, chop I, it up. Let's take this out. Let's take that out. You know, just, just get it out just because it's free. And as long as you got good chemistry with, with your uh so we'll call we'll call this fight a draw. All right. <laughs> All right, my man. All right. All right. So let's call it a night. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, everyone in the chat, thanks for coming out. I'll go. I'll listen to this on the car on the way to work tomorrow and see, what, see what's going on. Because I, I think you had some beautiful gems in there of, uh, of wisdom, my well, brother. Thank you. You did too, man. You did too. All right. All right. Well, hey, yep. stay frosty. I'll be talking to you, baby. Take right, it man. easy, chat. Slew, slew.